Hello, everyone. Welcome to this second session about the book of Hebrews. We're going to try to cover chapter two. And as I mentioned before, the book of Hebrews is very deep and very thick with a lot of information, a lot of spiritual knowledge and truth in every sentence and every paragraph. So I want to welcome you, especially those who are listening from Trinity Fellowship Church in Tyler, Texas, because this is based on our Sunday school classes, Sunday morning at 9.15 at the church, TFC. I know some of you aren't part of that in-person study, so you're going to get a look at what we talked about this last Sunday, which was um, January 21st. Now, if you are interested in keeping up with these videos, you might want to press the subscribe button, and then you'll get notified uh, when the next one's coming up. I try to do this every. I try to do these videos every week. All right. So let me screen share here just a bit, and uh, show you what we're doing. All right, so this is our slideshow, the book of Hebrews, the supremacy of Christ. And uh, this is our second week. And we've gone from the first chapter, which is more about stating the truths of Jesus Christ. The first chapter is a teaching. The primary point of the first chapter of the book of Hebrews is that Jesus is supreme to everything. He's greater than the angels. He set the entire universe in its place, and he holds the universe together, all about Jesus being superior. So the first chapter is a teaching. Now, the author of the book of Hebrews, from the first chapter to the second chapter, goes from teaching to preaching. And we're going to see that there's a challenge involved here. So what a preacher does is he lays out what the Bible says, and then he challenges the listener to fall deeper and deeper in love with our Savior, Jesus Christ, and with our Father God. Okay, so as we can see in the first verse, it talks about give more earnest heed. So this is Hebrews chapter 2. I'm reading from the New King James. <clears throat> Therefore, we must give the more earnest heed to the things we have heard, lest we drift away. Now, there's a challenge. Whenever you see the word more, that means that there is room for improvement. No matter how long you may have been in the Word of God, no matter how long you may be studying or teaching or serving in the kingdom of God, there's a deeper level of your devotion and your faith to the Lord. Because this book, as we have discussed before, the book of Hebrews was written to believers, specifically to Jewish believers in the first century after the resurrection of Jesus Christ. So it's not talking to people who are out on the edges and haven't enjoyed the blessings of salvation yet. This is to people who have been saved and are saved. And it's telling us, Christians, Bible-believing Christians, that there's more, and to give the more earnest heed. Now, one of the words that I use here to uh, express that, earnest heed, is a word that kind of dropped in my mind or in my soul at the very beginning of this year in January 2024. And uh, this was a this was a encouragement or maybe a rebuke to me because I need this to give more earnest heed. All right. So the word is diligence. I need to be more diligent in everything I do, from personal hygiene to doing these videos to teaching to loving my family 
to being a good husband, I need to be more diligent. Diligence. Definition. Persistent effort of body and mind and a constant and earnest endeavor to achieve everything undertaken while maintaining consistency in performing one's duties. So you see the word earnest in that definition too. Constant and earnest endeavor with both your body and your mind to achieve everything undertaken. And then the scripture that reinforces that to me is Colossians 3, verses 23 and 24. Colossians 3, verses 23 and 24, which says, whatever you do, work at it with all your heart as working for the Lord, not for human masters, since you know you will receive an inheritance from the Lord as a reward. It is the Lord Christ you are serving. So work with all your heart because we're working and we're serving for the Lord. Now, I want to give a, a little bit of a, I guess, a warning or a clarification. <clears throat> Whenever we receive a challenge to do more, or like in the Colossians verse, to do all, 100%, we need to step back from our own efforts. You with me? It's not in your own efforts or your work that you're going to accomplish those things for the Lord. What you have to do is step back and allow. That's a key word here. In order for us to give more earnest heed, we need to allow. Allow what? Allow the power of the Holy Spirit to empower us to comply with what the Lord is telling us. Because our Father God loves us. And he's not a dictator with his finger pointing at us, accusing us. He's a father who says, not only am I telling you what to do, but I'm giving you the power by the Holy Spirit to do what I'm telling you what to do. So relax. This isn't about making a list and checking it twice and pulling yourself up by the bootstraps and going forward in your own strength. The process is to meditate on the word of God. Blessed is the man, right? Psalms chapter one, blessed is the man who delights in the law of the Lord. So we love it. We love what God is telling us to do. And our behavior is not some kind of obligation. Our behavior and our acts and our works are a response of our love to the Lord. We love the Lord. We want to do what he says. So give more earnest heed. That's the beginning of the challenge. Lest you drift away. <laughs> now, if the word of God says that you have to be careful so that you don't drift away, that more than suggests that it is possible for those of us who have connected with the very throne room of God through the blood and the broken body of Jesus Christ and by the resurrection power of Jesus Christ, it is possible for us who have a love relationship with Jesus to drift away. Now, it might not be drifting totally away to where we're going to hell, but it certainly can be drifting away from our sincere, earnest devotion, giving all we have to the Lord. So we can drift away. So give the more earnest heed, lest you drift away. That's the first verse of chapter two. There's a lot there, isn't it? Verse two. For if the word spoken through angels proved steadfast and every transgression and disobedience received a just reward, how shall we escape if we neglect so great a salvation? <laughs> That's a huge... That's a huge uh, sentence there, one sentence. How shall we escape if we neglect salvation? Escape what? Well, the sentence says, escape a just reward. 
this uh, bullet may read a little more completely. Be careful about drifting away or else you will suffer the consequences of drifting away if you neglect your salvation. If you neglect your great salvation. So there's a powerful, important challenge by the word of God to, to, to draw closer and, and regulate every minute of every hour of every day by the power of the Holy Spirit. Daily, hourly, meditating on the word of God. Finding ways to stay connected with God's word and God's love all day long so that we would not fall into the results of drifting away. How shall we escape a just reward lest we drift away? So our salvation is great, it says. And it gives a little bit more clarification uh, in that verse. The, our salvation, which was spoken, confirmed, and witnessed. Spoken, confirmed, and witnessed. And it's the rest of chapter, uh, verse 2 uh, going into verse 3 and 4. Okay, so the way that the paragraph here discloses how it was communicated to us, this, this word, that it was first spoken by the Lord, right? And that could be through the prophets, through all the Old Testament history, through the Psalms, it was spoken first. Then it was confirmed to us by those who heard him. So the us here includes the author of Hebrews. So it's clear to me that whoever did write this book of Hebrews listen to the Lord in the first person. Confirmed to us by those who heard him, so heard him directly, in person. So that was the second way it was confirmed. And then God also bearing witness with signs and wonders, with various miracles and gifts of the Holy Spirit according to his own will. So, so after it was spoken, after it was confirmed, even to this day, the Lord confirms the message of salvation to us through signs, wonders, and miracles according to his own will. All right. Then it goes through a couple of verses here, verses 7 and 9, about comparing man to Jesus. And it mentions about that Jesus was lower than the angels, and so was man. What is man that you are mindful of him or the son of man that you take care of him? You have made him a little lower than the angels. Now, him in this verse is not capitalized. So what the book of Hebrews is saying here is that God made him or us a little lower than the angels. And earlier it mentioned how that Jesus was made lower than the angels. And then that we are crowned with glory and honor. You have made him little lower than the angels. You have crowned him with glory and honor. That's us. You have crowned us with glory and honor in the same way that God has crowned the Lord Jesus with glory and honor. All right, now we move over to chapter 2, verses 10 through 13. Let me find it here. Verse 10. For it was fitting for him, capital H, God, okay, for whom are all things and by whom all things in bringing many sons to glory to make the captain of our salvation perfect through sufferings. All right. So the first part of that is that all things are for him and by him. He made all things, including you and me, and the reason he made all things was for his glory. So every blessing that he pours out on us, the purpose of those blessings is to turn it back to give him glory. 
all things for him and by him. You with me? In other words, people will pray, you know, in the name of Jesus, Lord, I need some money. Or in the name of Jesus, I need a healing. Or in the name of Jesus, I need this situation to be rectified. Or well, all these different prayers. And God wants us to pray our needs. But as we do that, we need to keep in mind that as he blesses us with the answer to those prayers, we need to recognize that it is for his glory that he is blessing us. So it's for him and by him. And that goes also for the creation of the universe, the solar system, the planet, in us and everything that's in this world. All things by him and for him were made. All right. So that was verse 10. Bringing many sons to glory to make the captain of their salvation perfect through sufferings. <laughs> I love that image that Jesus Christ is the captain of our salvation and God brought him perfect, made him perfect through his sufferings. A lot of these um, descriptions of God the Father and God the Son reflect God the Son as He's walking on the face of the earth after his birth at the nativity through his death on the cross. That God made him the captain of salvation and brought made him perfect through suffering while he was walking around on the face of the earth. He was always perfect from before the beginning until the end of time because he was God, always is God, and always will be God. <clears throat> but while he was here, God made the captain of our salvation perfect through suffering. So the sanctifier and the sanctified are one. That's what we see. He who sanctifies, this is verse 11, for both he who sanctifies and those who are being sanctified are all of one, for which reason he is not ashamed to call them brethren. And remember what Jesus said in, the, in that moment of the Last Supper? And he says, as I am one in the Father, you are one in me, and you are one in the Father. So the sanctifier, which is Jesus Christ, the power of the Father through Jesus Christ, sanctifies us by his blood and his broken body, and the sanctified are one. Now, this reminds me of the principle that salvation is a little like a contract. The contract is between me and God. And usually with a contract, if I am offering something to the other party in the contract, that other party offers me back something of equal value. I might offer so many hours a week, and that person offers me an equitable salary or hourly wage for the service. That's a normal contract. But our contract with God, the only investment we have in the contract is our belief. Compared to what he gives us, which is, you know, heaven and earth, uh, a new life, uh, a way to walk in the spirit sanctified from our sins, uh, grace washing away our sins, and on and on and on and on. In other words, if we are contributing our faith, which might be 0 0.0001 to the contract, God side of the contract, his investment in us is six billion. Now there's an illustration out of Genesis 15 that uh, kind of shows this. And this is where God is uh, presenting Abraham with a contract. And the usual way that this ritual is performed between one man and another is that they will um, offer a, uh, 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 three animals. I think it's a bull, a, a ram, and a lamb. And they cut them in half. 
uh, these three animals and they put half on one side of a path and the other half on the other side of the path. And then both men walk through that path signifying their promise and their commitment to the contract, equal sides were walking through. But when God in Genesis 15 presented this ritual to Abraham, same thing, uh, three animals cut in half, and the three halves on one side of the path, three halves on the other side of the path. But he didn't have Abraham walk through. The fire of God was the only movement through that path. And what that signified, even to us today, is God pays both sides of the contract. And in our experience, by the unblemished lamb, Jesus Christ sacrificed on the cross. All right. And I think this is my last slide. The Savior and the saved ones. We share in the flesh and blood. This is verse 40, uh, 14a. <clears throat> Inasmuch then, as the children have partaken of flesh and blood, he, this is God, capital H, he himself likewise shared in the same, that through death he might destroy him who had the power of death, that is the devil, and release those who, through fear of death, were all their lifetime subject to bondage. Right? So he, this, this is by death, he, God, destroyed the devil. By Jesus' death on the cross, he destroyed the devil. And of course, the, the verse that comes to a lot of our minds is uh, the Gospel of John, chapter 10, that the thief came to steal, rob, and destroy. That's what the devil's mission is. But I, Jesus, have come to give you life and give it to you in abundance. And he who is greater in me is greater than him who is in the world, and so on and so forth. And then, in the last days, the book of Revelation reveals to us the final battle where Jesus has ultimate and complete victory over Satan. And release those who through the fear of death were all their lifetime subject to bondage. For indeed, he does not give aid to the angels, but he does give aid to the seed of Abraham. So here in this depiction, he sets us, the sanctified, who are the seed of Abraham, having more benefit from him than the angels. All right, then finally, verse 17 and 18, therefore, in all things, there's that word all again, because when Jesus does something, he does it completely, 100%, all. Therefore, in all things, he had to be made like his brethren, that's that oneness again, that he might be a merciful and faithful high priest in things pertaining to God, to make propitiation for the sins of the people, for in that he himself has suffered being tempted. He is also able to aid those who are tempted. So that is our lesson for today. Appreciate you tuning in, and and uh, I would suggest to you that you read through this chapter, chapter two, the book of Hebrews. Read it through again, and you might find a commentary. There's a lot of great websites that give deep insight into this book. One of them that I look at is called Enduring Word. So you can Google Enduring Word and then look for the teachings on the book of Hebrews there. So much, so powerful. So my prayer for you and myself as I end this uh, study is this. Father God, <clears throat> empower us this year, 2024, which looks to be a chaotic and divisive year, that you empower us with your love, 
with your truth and your wisdom that we can proceed with diligence, giving all we have to you, Father God, in the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. God bless you. We'll see you next week. Thank you.